Several years ago, I started looking into my family tree, um, and I started by going to Edgewood Cemetery to a family plot that's there and writing down all the names, and then going from there, taking those names and going to the library, doing some research. Um, and it was so, and I think a lot of people that get interested in cemeteries start off with being interested in genealogy and looking into their family history first. And then, um, I don't know, I just find cemeteries peaceful, beautiful. I mean, this time of year, the leaves are changing colors. It's, it's almost, it's like a park, but it's a park where there's not a lot of people. So you can really go to get away from the, the hustle and bustle, which is, it's funny because years ago, I've read that years ago, you know, cemeteries were considered parks. People would go and have picnics, and we don't, we don't do that anymore. You know, everybody just comes in, goes directly to their family member's grave, leaves their flowers, and they, they're gone. Most of them, most of them. Mm -hmm. um, then there's the pathophiles like me, which is the name of a person that loves cemeteries. <laughs> and how long did I, you do this before you learned the name? Uh, at least a couple years. <laughs> then I saw it in a random Facebook thing, you know, the little meme, taphophile, you know, a person that loves every aspect of a cemetery, and I'm like, yeah, it's me. <laughs> so, but they're just, they're quiet, they're nice, it's nice surroundings, it's a nice place to go when you want to be outdoors, but you don't want to be around a lot of people. Um, the, the, you know, because the noise, you know, if you go, when you go to the beach or the public parks, mm -hmm. the official parks that everybody likes to go to, it just, it gets so noisy and hectic and the cars coming in and out. And so, you know, when I need some downtime, I'll go to a cemetery. And it started mostly in the area, the ones in town, you know, Chestnut Grove and Edgewood and Maple Grove out in Plymouth. Um, then I started like noticing, you know, like I, the older graves, the really big prominent graves, the mausoleums, I, I started, you know, okay, this person must have been important, you know, who were they, you know, and kind of mm -hmm. stumbled across a list of past city leaders, so started wanting to do a project of getting pictures of historical graves, the graves of people that historically were significant to the area. And that was started when I was still on city council. Being on being on city council was kind of like I found it interesting. Maybe a lot of people don't, but I did. Um, and really, that part of it, the first people I started looking into, which will go up, we can go look at the Bridge Disaster Monument. It has the names of the people that helped get that monument built. And so I like you know just seeing these random names, people I never heard of, you know, this was over a hundred years ago and decided to start re doing some research and finding out all kinds of things. Okay, um, yeah, this is the mausoleum of James Lewis Smith. He's my personal favorite for the different, the characters I've discovered with my little project. And he donated the land that the hospital is on after the bridge disaster. There, the courtyard in front of ACMC is the James Lewis Smith Memorial Courtyard. And they have a nice little plaque there that talks about him donating the land. It has a old millstone from his old property that he lived on. Um, then starting to look into him a little bit further, then I started seeing his name everywhere. And he's one we pass by remembrances of James Lewis Smith every day here in Ashtabula, but most of us probably don't even realize it. You know, there's the hospital, there's uh, the Veterans Park, the tall monument with the eagle on top, those uh, Sailors and Soldiers monument that he had that put in. His name is on there if you go up close and look at it. Um, there's the monument over here for the Knights of Pythias that was built back in 1915. Smithfield, in his will, he, he owned Smithfield, the Ashfield Park. In his will, he left, basically had a 99-year <coughs> lease put into 
effect with the city for like a dollar a year basically gave it to the city it just wanted to did a lease to guarantee that it was always used as a public park um <clears throat> so what was he where did he make his money on i think mostly like property type things he was a i think basically like a real estate mogul owned a lot of land and i you know he's he's a interesting character yeah he never married he never had children so there's really nobody's carried on his memory except for the the people that have have taken care of his estate over the years mm -hmm. and there is actually a book a booklet called the smith estate history he also uh, park haven nursing home used to be the smith home for aged women yes and that was the front part of it was his house that's where he lived uh, him and his mother. Uh, I think his father died, you know, years before or whatever. She died and he didn't die. He died not too long after that. Right. Yeah, right. yeah she lived to be 91. So, and I think she must have been in frail health. So after her death, he felt that there was a need for a, a nursing home, you know, a home for aged women that they could have people taking care of them and looking after them and keeping them company. I, you know, back at that time were, you know, they were philanthropists, you know, always mm -hmm. trying to give to the community. Uh, they had a different philosophy on giving, truly giving to community, you know, not just saying you're giving to community, not for a tax write-off. It was, you know, a genuine, you know, wanting to better their community. This is the uh, Bridge Disaster Monument. Um, this is kind of where I started with my history project with getting pictures of the graves of significant individuals and it really started with seeing the names here of um, committee members which were J.L. Smith which I now know is James Lewis Smith who was chairman uh, I think it's T.W. McCreary was the secretary Lucian Seymour was treasurer which he's he's buried here in Chestnut Grove I did find that his brain as well um, and in addition to being involved with this committee he ended up becoming a mayor of the city at one time uh, then N.W. Simons and C.E. Richardson which I think C.E. Richardson is probably Clarence Richardson who also became a city manager later on um, when was this what's the time frame on this the bridge disaster occurred in 1876. And December. when was this built? Because this was a good time late, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it took a few years. Um, May monument erected May 30th, 1895. So, I mean, heck, that's almost 20 years after. Yeah. But just kind of shows you that you know they they didn't forget what happened. There are victims buried here? Yes, yeah, there's the unrecognized dead are, are here. Okay. And they have all the names of the unrecognized dead over on the side here. These, this is the names of those that uh, perished, the unrecognized dead, from the bridge disaster. Um, among them was Philip Bliss, who was a well-known hymn writer uh, back in the day. Uh, his hymns are still sung in, you know, Sunday service at churches across the country on a daily basis. And he probably is like our most famous resident here in the cemetery. Um, his story is interesting too, if you read up on the bridge disaster, because he got out of the, you know, the fire that was had was burning, and his wife didn't, and he went back in and. To, he tried to save her, he couldn't, so he went back in, basically came out, said, I'm going to join my wife, and went back in and died with her. So, it's kind of really sad to think about, but it just kind of shows you how, I don't know, people are different. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Wouldn't hear too many people doing that nowadays, I'd be like, oh, too bad. Uh, <laughs> um, but there's, these are the unrecognized dead. After the disaster occurred, they had left all the bodies there overnight um, and nobody stayed with them. So our lovely residents at that time went and decided to help themselves to their 
jewelry and even clothing. Okay, this is a mausoleum of Charles Collins. Um, he was the an engineer that worked for the railroad company that built the bridge that collapsed in 1876. Uh, the stories were that the design he had originally approved probably would have held up. The cost cutting, you know, and all that, they decided to go with a different design, which he never really gave his seal of approval. Uh, but when the disaster occurred, you know, a lot of people pointed the finger at him. And supposedly he killed himself shortly after, within a few months of the disaster. Um, other people believe that he was killed. There were two bullet holes found in the room where he was killed. So, you know, you're not, normally when you kill yourself, you're not going to miss. <laughs> so what's the theory about why he would have been murdered? Uh, there's, and it's conspiracy theories, but, you know, people think there might have been a cover-up that, you know, everybody wanted him to kind of go down for the whole thing happening, because back when it happened, it was a pretty good deal. It was... How long after the bridge was built do you know that it was... I'd have to look it up again. It's been a while, but I think it was just a few months. And then I think one of the other, uh, shortly after that, maybe within a few years, one of the other men involved with the railroad company did end up killing himself. Um, but I, it's the story stuff, the story's out there. It's everywhere on the internet. Um, you can get the whole story, you know, mm -hmm. pictures and everything. And I think people should, you know, if you don't know the story about the bridge disaster, you should go and, and look it up because it is very interesting. And, and there's a lot of the individual stories, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, if you, and if you do your research, enough research, you can find out those details. Just about, you know, some of the city managers that I've taken pictures, you know, family members have gone on Find a Grave or other sites and gotten their stories out there. And you get these little tidbits and you kind of get to know who these people were. And uh, it's just, it's interesting, you know, that... And I guess thinking of, you know, a hundred years from now, is someone going to find any of us interesting and want, you know, to the point that they want to tell our story? Okay, this is uh, one of the older stones uh, for the Hubbard family. There's several Hubbards listed on the stone, and including over here is William and Catherine that uh, are known for the Hubbard House down on Loma Boulevard, mm -hmm. which was part of the Underground Railroad. Um, but there's cupboards everywhere. And every, I think every cemetery I've been to so far in the county has at least one cupboard. <laughs> so it's kind You're of not a cemetery <laughs> until you have a hubbard. <laughs> <laughs> so I've taken, you know, that's one, they're one of my favorite ones to photograph just because I've spotted them even outside of Ashby a lot. You know, down in, Con it's the ones in Conyac, Geneva. I'll find, just stumble across a Hubbard and I'll take a picture. I'm like, they're everywhere. <laughs> um, but they're one of our good, you know, they were, one of the Hubbards was one of our early settlers and you know, really helped establish the city in the early years. And then, like I said, William and Catherine went on to build the, the Hubbard house and be involved in the uh, abolishment of slavery, that whole movement. So, which is another story I think people should, you know, if you don't know about the Hubbard House, if you don't know about the Underground Railroad in the county, you need to make it a point to, to learn about it. Because it's part, it's part of who we are, it's part of our history, uh, something to be proud of. Okay, this is uh, the grave of Roger W. Griswold, which took me quite some time to find. I, it's quite worn. I walked about by this thing probably a hundred times and never spotted it and then one day it just jumped out and bit me and this is the first mayor of Ashfield. This is uh, the grave of Henry Lawton Morrison. Um, there's extensive information about him on find a grave on the, the memorial for him so you know if you go into Chestnut Grove and look up Morrison you can kind of read up the whole his whole story, but it's kind of interesting. He, he, his mother died in childbirth, giving birth to him. So he was raised by his father's sister. 
He went to the Line Schoolhouse, which was, I guess, apparently half in Saybrook, half in Geneva, right on the, the Saybrook-Geneva line. Um, one thing I really like about Mr. Morrison here is he had a philosophy where he felt every citizen owed a duty to the town in which he lived. And he served as mayor in 1858, 1865 to 1866, and 1878 to 1879. So he had a few separate times, and I think he actually ended up being a county commissioner at one time. Um, he wasn't one to actively seek office. He wasn't a career politician, as I like to call. You know, we, we know who they are. <laughs> we have them amongst us nowadays. Um, it was people would go to him saying, you should, you know, why don't you run for me? If he was called upon, he would do it. Um, but he pushed for the completion of the Pittsburgh, Youngstown, and Asheville Railroad, which I believe was the first that the railroad had been brought to mm -hmm. the area. And I find that interesting because he was the grandfather of Robert S. Morrison, who went on to start Hold the Fiberglass, which is one of our you know, more recent uh, significant people that contributed to the community. And Robert Morrison, you know, of course, lived to be in his 90s. You know, so he had was from that old time thought process, that old philosophy. And I don't know, I just think we just need to, I would just like to see us get back to that, you know, that mm -hmm. philosophy. I think something has been lost in modern times, and maybe that's, that's why I like cemetery so much. That's why I am so interested in the history is, you know, I want to, some parts of it, you know, that one I'd like to see brought back. Uh, we're at Edgewood's, the old section of Edgewood Cemetery now. Uh, this is the grave of Peleg Sweet. Um, there's a lot of information about him out there on the internet as well. You probably um, passed on Route 20 at the corner of State Road. Uh, there's the Peleg Sweet Park. Um, mm. He owned a lot of land back in the day and he donated this land here where the Edgewood Cemetery sits. He donated the land for this cemetery. So I felt like he was, he's worth a special mention. Um, this old section is, is an interesting section to come and, and walk around and look at the old stones, um, see some of the names and, you know, kind of get a little peek into the history of the area. No. From a mechanical point of view, I don't know if mechanical is the right word, but you see some of these like this are so worn and stuff, and then others look pretty right. good. What was, what's the best thing for a stone, <laughs> or what, you know, what did they use that worked then? And I think the marble, a lot of these might be marble, and then you'll have some that have more like a sandstone. Uh-huh. I don't know, you know. But I guess after a couple hundred years. Right. <laughs> There's a one in uh, Geneva, I have a picture of what from one of the Geneva cemeteries that is so worn you can't read anything on it. it just, just all just kind of carved out throughout through the years, and I believe that uh, definitely has to be sandstone. These are the, uh, the graves of the McAdams family. Um, it's another popular story. It's uh, well, the newspaper has done many articles about the family. The story was that the oldest sister Jeanette had killed her younger siblings one by one over a period of time um, suspected by poisoning that she she and she was a strange character she would dress in men's clothes and, and kind of disappear for months at a time and then show up at home and then then another and, person would die right yeah so. <laughs> right so um, this is Eliza which very worn with you know, the wife, the mother of the, the children. 
Um, there's Julia. There's another one that's fallen, has fallen on the ground over there. Um, but you know, the, supposedly that if you look up Haunted Edgewood Cemetery, you know, you'll find little stories that supposedly the, the sister haunts the area, you know, tormenting her siblings or whatever. Um, I haven't seen any evidence of that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's it's interesting. It's another little piece of our, our history our, and the folklore. Um, those stories are always interesting.